Hey, Amen. If you have your Bibles, we go with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I've already had a great time in the house of the Lord this morning and enjoyed that singing. It's good to hear singing about Jesus because I'm sure we're going to preach about Jesus this morning. So I'm glad everything could work out and go together. John chapter number 8. I thank God for uh, Clearbrook Baptist Church and I thank God for your pastor. Brian and I were um, in school together at Crown College. I graduated about two years ago. And I tell you, your pastor is one of the greatest friends I have from Crown College. And you will not meet anyone from Crown that will have something bad to say about your pastor. That person just does not exist. So your pastor, you had a great testimony. Now, there's some things in the dorm that, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wasn't in the same dorm with him, but um, I thank God for his friendship and I thank God for his testimony. And um, if you have your Bibles, John chapter number eight, we're just gonna read a few verses here. Gonna begin reading in verse 31. John chapter eight and verse 31. The Bible says, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being so good and kind to us. God, I thank you for blessing us with an opportunity to be here in your house this morning. God, I thank you for the singing. God, I thank you for just the sweet spirit that's here. God, I pray just meet with us in a special way this morning. God, you told us in your word where two or three are gathered in your name. There you are in the midst. So, Lord, there's no doubt in my mind that you're here this morning. But, Lord, I ask you that you'll reveal yourself to us in a special way. God, I pray that you'll leave us here to this morning, God, not saying that we've heard a word from the preacher, but God, that we've heard a word from you. So, God, I pray to speak to hearts and change lives as only you can, and we'll give you all the praise and honor for it. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. We know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what we call the gospel records. When we look into the gospel records, we get to see a glimpse of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. When we get to the book of Matthew, we see something that's very amazing. We see that the Son of God is becoming the Son of a man. John said it like this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. About 12 verses later, he says, And the Word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us. That was a direct reference to Jesus Christ. Now, we have to understand something now. When Jesus came to his earthly ministry, John, at this time, in a physical sense, he was more popular than Jesus Christ. That's why John would say, he must increase and I must decrease. John was preaching about Jesus and he had to stop his sermon. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the whole world. John had to tell the people, I am not worthy to unbuckle this man's shoe latchet. He had to let the people know that Jesus Christ, he is much bigger than me. He said he must increase and I must decrease. Sometimes in our own life, we must lower ourselves so we, that, so we can lift up Jesus Christ. And it would not take long for the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ to take off. Jesus now, he will be walking on water. He's turning water into wine. He's feeding 5,000. He's raising up dead men. Every time we see Jesus in the gospel records, we see Jesus. He's with people. And when we get to John chapter number 8, there's no difference. In John chapter number 8, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're bringing to Jesus a woman who has been taken or a woman who has been caught in adultery. And they are bringing this woman to Jesus not to get help, not to get healed, not so she can get saved, but they want this lady to be stoned and to be punished for her sins. Jesus then looks at the people and he basically tells them this, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And I love what the Bible says. The Bible says that the people being convicted in their own conscience, the Bible says they left one by one. Jesus then turns to the lady and, she said, and he says to her, lady, go and sin no more. Now, look, this was not Jesus was not telling this lady that you are to now live a sinless life. But he's saying now that you've come in contact with me and now that you've met me, the lifestyle that you were caught in and the lifestyle that you were taken in should now change. You know, look, we don't. The, the issue is not that people are sinners. Everyone is a sinner. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the issue that we have now is that we have men and women and boys and girls who have say they had an, had an encounter with Jesus Christ, but their lifestyle has not changed. Right. Jesus said, hey, now that you've come in contact with me, your lifestyle should change. Go and sin no more. Amen. Jesus then turns to the people and he starts preaching. Jesus says, I am the light 
of the world. And for about 20 verses now, Jesus would preach a message. Get this now. Jesus preached a message and the title of the message was Jesus. He said, I am the light of the world. I do always those things that please my father. My judgment is true. I am not alone. I bear witness of my father. The father has sent me on and on. Jesus. Now get this. He's preaching about Jesus. Look, I wish I could have been a little fly on a wall to listen to Jesus preach about Jesus. And by the way, if Jesus took time to preach about Jesus, I think it's safe to say that we need men of God today that will preach about Jesus. There's no greater message and there's no greater sermon. There's no greater song than something that will lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus preached on Jesus. <laughs> and, and the results of Jesus preaching on Jesus was easy professions. Easy. Pro That's why the Bible says in John chapter number eight, verse number 30. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. But Jesus now he's about to weed out this bunch. It's not hard to find a crowd that will say, I believe in Jesus. I believe on Jesus. But Jesus now, he's going to weed them out. He says, hey, but if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Yeah. So he goes from their easy profession. Then he goes to their evidence and their proof. Now I'm just not I'm not just listening to what you're saying. Now I'm watching how you're living. Because if I look at your lifestyle and if I look at how you're living, then I will know that you are my disciples indeed. And Jesus, now he turns to the crowd and no matter what this lady was going through, no matter what this man was going through, he looks at the entire crowd and he says this. The truth shall make you free. Get that now. He says the truth shall make you free. Jesus, now he gives an, an entire audience the same solution because they all had the same problem. The problem was that they were all sinners. And Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. And then in the next verse, he says, the son shall make you free and you shall be free indeed. Let's not think that this is a contradiction. All right. That oh, one verse said the truth shall make you free. And another verse says the son shall make you. Free. What is he talking about? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the father but by me. So this is not a contradiction because the truth is Jesus and Jesus is the truth. That's right. It's all one and the same. So Jesus now he starts talking to these people. And I want you to notice with me how they were oblivious to their state. They were oblivious to the state. Look at this. Jesus says to them, the truth shall make you free. Verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Look, look, look at their pride. It's almost like they're, they're talking to Jesus and they say, Jesus, do you know who you're talking to? Look, he said, we be Abraham's seed. Look, notice their pride. And look, if a, if a person is not willing to let go of their pride, they will live a life that is completely separated from God. In order for me to be saved, I had to admit that I am a sinner. I'm on my way to hell and I am in need of a savior. And if a person is so prideful that they cannot admit that, they will not be made free. They were prideful. Then they started presupposing some things. This is so amazing to me. We be Abraham seed. Jesus, do you know who you're talking to? And watch this. They said this. And we're never in bondage to any man. Somehow. We be Abraham's seed. The Jews. The children of Israel. God's chosen people. We were never in bondage to any man. Look, their, their presupposition, it was both inaccurate and it was ignorant. Yeah, that's right. we, we were never in bondage to any man. Wait a minute. Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. We were never in bondage to any man. For, all, for nearly 400 years, the children of Israel were in bondage to Egypt. They could not return to the promised land unless they got permission from a Persian king. Then when the New Testament came, Rome came and took over everything. We were never in bondage to any man, Jesus. You, you know what's so amazing about today? We're not just dealing with people that are in bondage. We're dealing with people that are in bondage and they don't even know it. We were never in bondage. It was inaccurate. We were never in bondage to any man, but it was ignorant. Hey, I'm not talking about your physical bondage. I'm talking about your spiritual bondage. But whether I'm talking about your physical bondage or your spiritual bondage, guess what? You're still wrong. You were in bondage to, to men, but you're also in bondage to sin. So he goes from their pride to their inaccurate presupposition. Then he goes to their problem. He just gets to it. Look, look, look at what he says in John chapter number eight. The Bible says they answer him, we, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How then, and, and you say that we shall be made free. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, 
whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Look, Jesus just got straight to the problem. You are in bondage. And basically, look, you are a slave to sin. Right. And then he says this. And the servant, the slave, abideth not in the house forever. You know what he's saying? You being a slave to sin, you have no control over your own life. If I have a slave, if I say, hey, get me some water. You know what that slave better do? Get me some water. If I say, hey, bring me some Reese's peanut butter cups. You know what they do? I love Reese's. Bring me. Come on now. Preach, brother. Bring me some Reese's peanut butter cups. You know what he's going to do? Bring me some Reese's peanut butter cups. If I say, then he says, the servant abideth not in the house. Forever. If I say, get out of the house, you know what they do? They get out of the house. Watch this now. A slave does what he or she is told. Jesus looked at him and said, you are a slave to sin. Sin is your taskmaster. If sin says lie, guess what you do? You lie. If your flesh says party, guess what you do? You party. If your flesh says steal, guess what you do? You steal. You are a servant to sin. You just do what you are told. Then he says, but the truth now, the truth can make you free. I, I, I just want to give a quick example. Can I use you, Pastor Brian and Brother David? This is a quick example. I just, want to, I just want you to get in your mind the picture of what Jesus has done for us. I'm going to have Pastor Brian over here. Brother David, I want you right here. Brian, you're going to be God, just in the example. All right? <laughs> just in the example. You're going to be God. You're going to be Adam. I want you to link up just a little bit here. Oh. Like you're going on a nice little day. Right? <laughs> okay. Look, Brother Brian is God. Brother David, he's Adam. When God first created Adam, now, by the way, God did create man. It wasn't a big bang. We didn't come from a monkey and our tails didn't fall off, all right? God created man. And God said, let us make man in our own image. Why would God say us in our if there's no one else created yet? He's speaking of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when God first created man, God said, I want mankind to look just like me. When God first created man, mankind was created in, in complete perfection and in innocence. They were, they were created and they were created sinless. So there was no separation. But Adam and Eve in the garden, they sinned. And watch this now. The fellowship was broken. So now the Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So now when I'm born, since I'm coming from the bloodline of Adam, I am born. Get this now. I am born separated from God. So this is why Jesus came. God sees that his creation is now separated from him. And God sends his son Jesus to earth to reconnect God and man. Look, yes, when Jesus came on earth, yes, he walked on water. Yes, he fed 5,000. Yes, he turned water into wine. Yes, he walked into a graveyard and told a dead man to get up. And guess what he did? He got up. But the greatest miracle that Jesus ever did was when he died on the cross, reconnecting God and man. Look, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Look, Jesus now, when he died, he reconnected God and man. But get this now. If I die the way I was born, I will forever be separated from God. Thank you. So Jesus now, he gets straight to the problem. You're a sinner. You are a sinner. But then, even though they were oblivious to their state, they didn't know that they needed to be made free. Jesus still gave them an opportunity to be salvaged. I'm so glad that when God saw me in my sinful state, he did not leave me there. He didn't just look at it and say, oh, poor Ed. Look at Ed. He's just a sinner. He's just wicked. No, no, no. He already, good look, God anticipated the needs of mankind. The Bible says that from the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. Meaning that before God ever created this world in his eyes, his son Jesus had already died for the sins of mankind. So he gave them an opportunity to be salvaged. Look, it was a definite proposal. He says, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free. Look, I love this word. Indeed. Amen. No, that, mean, that just means truly. You say, you say well, well, you don't know what I've been through. I don't have to know what you've been through. If the son shall make you free, you shall be free. Indeed. It, look, there is not one person in this world that has sinned so much or that has sinned so bad that Jesus cannot save. The grace of God overpowers the strongest sin any man could ever commit. Because if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. It was a definite proposal. Then they were following a different process. 
they're, they're literally just, this whole chapter is filled with a bunch of questions, a bunch of people asking questions that aren't really looking for an answer. They're just asking questions trying to disprove Jesus. So they're just going on now. And look at verse number 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed. Get that. You ever tried to tell God something he already knew? Look, I know that you're Abraham's seed. You don't have to tell me that. I already know. I know that you're Abraham's seed. Watch this now. But you seek to kill me. Wait a minute. Abraham now, a friend of God. Abraham was a man that walked with God. Look, if you are from the seed of Abraham, speaking of spiritually now, you would do what Abraham did. Abraham was my friend, but watch this now. You're seeking to kill me. Look, look what he says. But ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. And I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Look, he, he, he gets straight to the point. He tells them now that you are seeking to kill me because my word, it has no place in your heart. You're following a different, different process because there's a displacement of my word. Look, it is so important now in churches, and I'm so thankful that we have a church here that's been here for 30, 32 years that preaches the word of God. Look, we can come together and we can eat, we can sing, we can shake hands and we can fellowship, but the most important time in the church is when someone stands up and preaches the truth of the word of God. The church is to be the pillar in the ground of the truth. Look, I was thinking when I was sitting there, there are very few things that we can do in church without the truth. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I can't even praise my Savior without the truth. We look at this chapter. I can't be pardoned from my sins without the truth. I can't prepare my sermon without the truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I couldn't stand up here right now and preach God's word without the truth. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, exhort, reprove rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, truth. Without the truth, we couldn't even meet here this morning. So he said, look, you're following a different process because there's a displacement of my word. Then he goes to some observations that he stated. Jesus now, he starts off making this first observation where he's giving a comparison of their lineage. Look at um, verse number 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Think about that now. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Look, this is what he's saying. The comparison of their lineage, right? He's saying, you are not doing the works of your father, Abraham. You're doing the works of your other father. Jesus said, I have seen that, I speak that which I have seen with my father, capital S, so speaking of deity, God the father. He says, you're doing what you've seen with your father. Well, okay, who's their father? Well, look, let's think about it now. What are they doing? You're seeking to kill me. Watch this now. Now let's look down to verse number, verse number 44. Oh boy. This is where the chapter is really going to take off now. Jesus is speaking now. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer. Whoa. Time out. You, you seek to kill me. You're doing the works of your father. Guess what? He was a murderer. Look, th let me put it in our words. This is what Jesus is saying. Boy, you look just like your daddy. <laughs> look, he's looking at him. He said, you look just like your daddy. Your daddy, he was a murderer. Now you're seeking to kill me. You're doing exactly what your father would do. I want to ask you a question this morning. Based upon your actions, based upon my actions, who does it show our father is? Who, who does it show? You can't say, oh, well, on Sunday, my father's God, but on Monday, you know, I, no, no, no. It's no mixed breeds here. It, look, it, it's one or the other. You can't be half and half. Is your father God or is your father the devil? And when I was born, I was a child of the devil. But once I got saved, I got born again. Now I'm a child of God. He, I went from being a slave to being a son. I'm now a child of God. He's saying, look, the comparison of your lineage. Then he said, the consistency of your life, you're not doing the works of Abraham. There's a problem. Then he goes to some conflicts, and I'll just go through these here. I could literally stay in this chapter all day, but I'm not going to, all right? I'm a little hungry. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Don't laugh at me. I'm not the only one that's hungry, man. <laughs> Verse number 42, he starts, starts giving off some conflict. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. I have a conflict with your love. 
For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came out of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? I have a conflict with your learning. Even because you cannot hear my word. Now I have a conflict with your listening. You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father. You would now have a conflict with your lust. Look, this is what he's basically saying. You are still living under the natural pull of the flesh. And because there's no consistency in your life, now it's causing a conflict with the Lord. And Jesus now, they literally, they just start debating with Jesus. And Jesus now, they don't believe that he's the son of God. They don't believe that he can make them free. They don't believe that they're even in bondage. So Jesus now, he gets completely open with them. The openness of the Savior. I love this because Jesus, he's completely transparent. Look at what he says. Verse number 46. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why believe ye not me? Look, because Jesus was transparent, he could be trusted. Look, you can trust a person that's transparent. Look, some of us, we wouldn't dare come into an auditorium like this with this many people, with, of people that knew us, and say, which of you convinced me of sin? Boy, hands go up all over the room. I got, I got something on you. I got something on you. Jesus now, which of you convinced me of sin? No one said anything because he was sinless. He, there was no sin. Herod said, and Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. They could have looked for centuries and they could have looked for decades and never found a thing. He was the spotless lamb of God. And because he was transparent, which of you convinced me of sin? Look at the Ten Commandments. Did I break any of them? Go ask the, the disciples that follow me. Ask my mom. Did I break any of them? Which of you can be, and because he was transparent, he could be trusted. You know a problem that we have when it comes to giving the truth to people? Some people, they can't trust us because we are not transparent. That's right. yeah. well, but before we ever say anything, how we are living has already shut them down. Before I ever go try to give the gospel, they've been watching me already. And they cannot receive the gospel because they, can, look, they cannot receive the truth because I've been living a lie. Jesus now, when he was given the truth, which of you convinced me of sin? I've never lied to you before. Why would I start lying now? So Jesus now, he was completely open. And then we find out that this crowd, and this is what we see a lot of times today, they were obsessed with their stance. They were just obsessed. Look, I, I haven't been in ministry very long, but something I've already learned. Some people just will not change. <laughs> you can preach all day. You can spit all over the sanctuary. You can lose your voice preaching. You can sit down in council. They can, they can come down to the altar and get up and never change. These people are sitting down listening to Jesus preach, and they didn't change. 